and gentlemen, welcome back to Adrian First and 15. Uh, I'm very proud to have the um, actually exiting president of the Yaki Juniors, Dr. Ibon Eguluz Gracia from uh, Spain. Good morning, Ibon. Good morning, Buya. Um, we had um, this uh, amazing topic um, uh, prepared uh, since a few months. Uh, and uh, the collaboration between the Association Nazosano and the Yaki Juniors started a few months ago. So we decided to have both the Yaki president and the exiting president, uh, Yvonne, um, for a, a talk during our uh, uh, ground rounds. Uh, today, Yvonne is going to talk about the nasal allergen challenge and how much uh, could impact our clinical and research um, during our allergic rhinitis diagnosis. So I will, uh, after this introduction, I will lead the, the talk to Yvonne. And uh, at the end, I would please once again ask all the participants to ask questions after the talk. Please go ahead. So thank you very much, Puya. It's a great pleasure for me to, to present this topic, which is very much related to my, both my clinical and research activity. And also thank you very much for the, to the Naso Sano Association to, to show the interest to collaborate with the EACI, with the EACI junior members, and also to, to include these topics about the uh, nasal inflammation in this very interesting program of uh, adherent webinars, including both the uh, surgical aspect and this more related to nasal inflammation, which is also very relevant for ENT doctors, and of course for, for allergies, and is uh, one of the areas where the allergies and the ENT doctors, we can collaborate more and we can like uh, do better things for the benefit of our patients. So uh, uh, I want to discuss today about this procedure, the nasal allergen challenge, uh, that has been uh, described and used for, for many decades, but in, uh, in recent years, it has uh, gained significant attention and utilization of the process. Uh, because uh, this is crucial to interpret the results and uh, to rely on what we see. So uh, this is the outline of what I want to discuss today with you. First, starting with an introduction, then describing the current uses of the nasal allergy and challenge, and then uh, the main part of my talk, we actually discuss the methodology, because it's the main important aspect in order to implement it in the clinical practice and also to obtain reliable results that help us to take clinical decisions. That is the final goal, even though it is also used for research, but I mean, in this talk, I will focus mainly on the clinical applications, and then I will end up with summary and conclusions. So uh, what is the nasal allergen challenge? The nasal allergen challenge is a medical procedure aiming to evaluate the response of the nasal mucosa to a controlled allergen exposure. And uh, uh, with this uh, definition, we can use the procedure both as a clinical tool, as a research tool, as I mentioned before. So very recently, in 2018, EACI uh, published, after a work of uh, more than one year, of, of, uh, of uh, several years, of a task force of the standardization of the nasal allergen challenge, this, uh, this position paper was published in Allergy and Release. And uh, the, the rationale why this work was needed is uh, to try to address the unmet needs in the methodology of the nasal allergen challenge. Because uh, up to the publication of this, of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of this document, the allergen dose and the quality of the dose was very viable. Uh, the allergen application technique was not defined. It was questioned whether uh, there was uh, a need for a titration process, meaning we have to administer uh, diluted doses of the allergen before the full dose of the allergen or we could go for the full dose uh, from the first administration, whether we needed to provoke one or two nostrils, unilateral or bilateral nasal challenge. This was also a big debate. And also what was the ideal method to assess both subjective and objective parameters of the nasal allergen. Current uses of the nasal allergen challenge. So this is uh, the, the second part. So. Uh, of course, we use the nasal allergen challenge to diagnose allergic rhinitis, allergic rhinitis. Uh, and this diagnosis of allergic rhinitis can be done with different purposes. We want, we, sometimes we aim to evaluate the clinical significance of individual allergens in polysensitized patients, and also to solve discrepancies between the clinical history and the IgE sensitization test. So these two aims actually go 
usually together. So if we have a, a polysensitized patients, we, we don't know if all those sensitization are genuine sensitization on flow reactivity, and therefore we are not sure about the clinical relevance of those sensitization. And in many cases, the patient is sensitized, for instance, to seasonal allergens, and only uh, all, and has symptoms during all the year. And we don't know if that is related to sensitization, to nasal hyperreactivity, to anatomical disorder, to everything at the same time. So there are many confounding factors. And to solve these discrepancies and to assess the clinical significance of sensitization, we can do the nasal allergy charters. In general, we don't do that in every patient. We do that in immunotherapy. And we need to decide the composition of allergen immunotherapy. And in this, uh, to this end, the nasal challenge can be very helpful. There are other specific phenotypes of uh, allergic rhinitis, like local allergic rhinitis or occupational rhinitis, where we really need the nasal allergen challenge. It's the only way to diagnose them. In the local allergic rhinitis, because the, the patients are not sensitized, uh, they have uh, negative skin prick tests and serum allergen specific IgE, and the disease is only recognized through the challenge. And in occupational rhinitis, Sometimes we can find sensitization, but for legal uh, consequences of the diagnosis and uh, also legal and economical consequences of the diagnosis, it is needed to have a confirmation diagnosis. And the nasal challenge is the only way, is the gold standard to confirm the clinical relevance of a sensitization. So in many cases, the, the challenge is also needed. Also, sometimes we want to evaluate if the patient, in a patient with ocular symptoms and nasal symptoms, we want to evaluate if ocular symptoms are due to a nasal ocular reflex or other mechanisms, or the patient has a true sensitization, conjunctival sensitization. So to evaluate the nature of the, of the ocular symptoms, the, the procedure can be also helpful. Then uh, other, other, other of the uh, uses or the, the indications beyond diagnosis will be to evaluate the effect of allergen immunotherapy in allergy rhinitis. And not all of allergen immunotherapy, of any treatment used for uh, uh, allergy rhinitis, theoretically, we could use the nasal allergen challenge. So to follow up and monitor the clinical response. So we perform a nasal challenge before and after, and we see with the treatment, we see differences. That is, uh, of course, uh, mostly used for research, for clinical trials, but at least in theory, it could be also used uh, to assess the response to a treatment also in the clinic. So, uh, of course, the procedure has several contraindications. Some of them are temporary, others are absolute. Acute nasal ocular inflammation, like the common call, of course, you cannot do a nasal challenge if the patient has a common call. Uh, the surgery of the nose or paranasal sinuses, it is recommended to wait uh, one month and a half, two months before performing the nasal allergy challenge. If the patient is pregnant or, or sees breastfeeding, uh, and uh, also in the position paper of the ACI, it's not recommended to 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 perform the challenge uh, in the in the weeks after uh, a vaccine uh, a vaccination against infectious agents. So you need to wait one week and then you can you can perform the nasal challenge. So all these contraindications are temporary. What about absolute contraindications? Uh, the condition severely affecting the nasal patency. We can all think about the septum perforation, for instance, severe airway disease, especially asthma, but also COPD, and in general, the other severe and stable hair or systemic disease, especially more than severe and stable. No? We have to, we cannot perform the procedure. And uh, because of methodological uh, reasons, the nasal challenge cannot be performed in preschool children because we need some degree of cooperation and they are not able to provide it. And whenever or wherever the extracts are not available, we have to have good quality extract of a minimum quality. If not, we cannot interpret anything of the risk. So, but as I mentioned, the challenge, the nasal allergy challenge is also a research tool. And uh, uh, it can be used in clinical research to evaluate the efficacy of a therapy for allergy rhinitis in a clinical trial. For instance, uh, in the, another EACI position paper published in 2014 uh, about the uh, standardization of clinical outcomes used in allergy and immunotherapy trials, the nasal allergy challenge is included as a valuable outcome because you can evaluate the amount of allergen tolerated by the patient before and after the allergen immunotherapy, for instance. And this is a study published by our group in 2017, uh, six months of allergen immunotherapy versus placebo in local allergic rhinitis patients. You can see here that the patients who receive the placebo, the nasal tolerance of the allergen doesn't increase. In those who receive allergen immunotherapy, the 
they were able to tolerate much higher concentration of allergen. And this was done through a regular nature allergen. So it's a well-established tool for clinical reason. What about translational or more basic research? It can be, it can be used because the nasal allergen challenge allows you to collect samples before and after the procedure or at different time points during the procedure. And you can, if you collect nasal secretions before and after the nasal allergen challenge, you can measure inflammatory mediators like uh, immunoglobulin cells, cytokines, etc. But what is mostly published in the, in the literature, for instance, to measure eosinophil mediators in the nasal secretions or mast cell mediators mediators, eosinophil mediators, for example, eosinophil cationic protein, muscle mediator tryptase, you can measure those uh, molecules in the secretions and you can also say something and gain insight into the mechanisms of the disease, etc. Also, uh, the nasal allergy challenge allows you to collect not only secretions but also nasal biopsies and uh, different time points during the nasal challenge. For instance, this is a study that we conducted in, in Norway. So we took biopsies before the nasal challenge and then we, we, we went for the nasal allergen challenge and we took biopsies after the nasal challenge and different time points. And in this case, we were able to measure in by immunostochemistry different cells that we were interested about. So it, of course, it's also useful for translational research. So, now that I have uh, gone through the uses, I want to discuss more in depth the methodology, which is the main aim of this, of this webinar. So preliminary consideration. So the, tame, the timing of the nasal allergen challenge. It also depends on the allergen we are testing. For seasonal allergens, it is recommended to perform the nasal allergen challenge out of the pollen season, at least one month or before or after the season. So to be sure that the inflammation has gone down. For perennial allergens, we are more it's more difficult to decide the perfect timing because of course they are present all the time. But even they are present during all the year, there are seasonal variations. So for instance, the mites are present all the year, but during the summertime, in general, they are less than in the autumn, for instance. So it will be preferable to perform a nasal challenge with mites during the summertime. So also the room where the procedure is performed is important. It has to have specific conditions. It has not to be contaminated by other substances. This is important because in many hospitals, the room where the nasal challenge is performed is the same room where, for instance, the metacoline provocation is performed for asthma patients. So if the, if the patients are inhaling at the same time other products, that can also alter the results. The room has to have a controlled temperature and humidity and quiet and calm atmosphere. I can tell you, for instance, in my hospital, the room with the nasal challenge are done, the, the door must be always closed because it has to have like, let's say, homogeneous and, and, and uh, conditions. It cannot be changing all the time because this also affects the, 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 the response of the nose. So it is recommended that the patients acclimatize for the room at least 15 minutes before the, the challenge is started. So there, there has to be a process of acclimatization of the nasal mucosa to the wrong conditions. Of course, it has to be performed by trained personnel with access to rescue medication and also ideally with access and a spirometer. Even though uh, the nasal provocation, as I will show later, is a very, very safe technique. So we very recently published a very big study of the safety of this technique. And, and I, I will explain later that it's extremely safe even in asthma patients. So this also helps the clinical implementation of the technique. So, of course, it is recommended that the patients have a washout period of the different drugs. So, uh, this is uh, and also a, a consensus document published by the American Academy of Allergy in uh, 2018. And here they recommend washout periods for the different drugs that uh, usually patients with rhinitis takes. Of course, antihistamines and corticosteroids, uh, topical or either systemic, but also other drugs like uh, aspirin, etc. So, um, uh, I am interested, for instance, in leukotriene modifiers because leukotrienes, anti-leukotrienes are usually, I mean, their indications is asthma. They don't have any other indication. But I believe that we all have the feeling that in some patients, they can also help with the rhinitis symptoms. So in this uh, position paper, they don't recommend any specific washout period for leukotrienes, but I would recommend also at least one week of uh, not taking them before performing a nasal challenge because I think that they have also effects over nasal inflammation. Of course, alcohol or tobacco should be avoided at least uh, one, two days. 
So these are the preliminary considerations. So let's move to the next step, what is very crucial step, the allergy solutions and the application of the allergens. So the test solutions, uh, we can have different types of test solutions. They can be used as ready-to-use solutions, already, uh, already uh, diluted. We buy them when they are already diluted. Or what we can buy is a liophilic state, like the powder, and then we have to dilute the powder to, to bring it to an to a aqueous solution. So this is important to consider that both uh, the ready-to-use solution or, or the liophilicate, they have very tight expiration deadlines. Once we open them, they have to be used usually in one month, something like that. So you if you don't perform nasal challenge uh, on a regular basis and you want to perform uh, for a certain period, it's recommended that you cluster all the patients over one week or two weeks because if after that, you, won't know, we, you will not be able to use this solution. You will have to throw them away and, and use new ones. And they are quite expensive. So it's important that to cluster the patients because they have tight expiration deadlines. These solutions are isotonic. They have pH neutral. They should be stored at four degrees. And because they should be stored at four degrees to preserve the proteins, we need also to bring them to room temperature before use. So the patient needs to acclimatize to the room, but also we need to have the, the, the allergens acclimatize themselves, because if we apply a very cold allergen, that will produce a, a specific reactivity, of course. Uh, it's not recommended to use the skin prick test extracts for nasal provocation, because they are glycerinated, and this has, uh, is irritative for the nasal mucosa. So this is a strongly discouraged to use uh, the skin prick test for the nasal provocation. In the acuposition paper from 2018, uh, the allergen is recommended that the allergen concentration of the extras is given in international system units, micrograms per milliliter, for instance. But unfortunately, this is quite, quite strange because most of the manufacturers use their own concentration units and they are brand specific. So uh, many times uh, they are usually standardized by biological uh, power rather than through concentration the micrograms per milliliter. So sometimes it's hard to know the exact amount of allergen you are administering. What about allergen titration? Allergen titration means giving increasing doses concentration, sorry, of the allergen before the maximum concentration. I mean, in general, it's not recommended for the routine clinic. It can be done with research purposes and to assess the response to a therapy, but in the routine clinics, uh, usually, at least in the position paper of the act, is not recommended. Allergen application techniques. So there are different, uh, mo different methods to apply the allergen to the nostril. This is the, the Spanish guidelines for nasal provocation. They are a bit old from 2011, but there is still some interesting information in this document. The, it can be applied by a syringe, by a nose dropper, micro pipette of nasal spray. I would say that micro pipette and nasal spray are the most commonly used techniques but also other more strange things like impregnated cotton or impregnated this placed in the head of the lower turbinate for 10 minutes, something like that. So in the acid position paper from 2018, what we recommend is the nasal spray, but other techniques are also accepted as uh, valid to apply the allergy. So the, here we have several examples. Of course, the nasal spray is what uh, I think is most commonly used and what's most easy to, to understand. The micro pipette, uh, that is what we use in our department in Malaga, actually. We, we, we open the nostril with a rhinoscope and then we administer 100 microliters uh, in the head of the lower two minutes by this micro pipette. And it's usually easy to perform. If you have the impregnating disc, as you can see in the lower part of the slide, you have to place it in the, also in the head of the lower turbinate for 10 minutes. But of course, it's more, more difficult to put it, to be sure that you have placed it in the correct area, etc. So the application techniques is also important. And in the acuposition paper, because they favor the spray, they explain very thoroughly how the spray has to be administered. So what is recommended is a bilateral application by a spray vial with a, a 15 microliters nozzle. So uh, this, uh, there were like uh, big discussions about uh, if bilateral or unilateral application, but finally it was decided that bilateral was more reliable and this is the current standard. 
So of course you have to test the sprite prior to the challenge, just in the room, do it like that to make sure that it will deliver actually the 50 microliters. And you administer two pubs of 50 microliters per nostril, two here and two here. So uh, normally it is recommended that the, that the first pub uh, is administered with a spray placed uh, in parallel to the, to the floor of the nostril. And then the second pub in a, a 45 degree position uh, heading to the medium meatus, for instance. We need also some patient's collaboration uh, the patient is told to breathe deeply before the application, to hold breath during the application, and to exhale profoundly after the application. And this method will allow us to prevent aerosol penetration of the lower airways. And one very simple thing for every nasal application in a spray is to avoid always the nasal septum. As saying that for a nasal corticosteroids as, the, as therapeut therapeutic agents, we have always to try to move the spray, the new cell of the spray, uh, against the cell. Okay, so, and the next tricky point is how we measure the outcomes. This is very important. So, in the, in the position paper by Eaki, uh, it is said that the evaluation should always include one objective and one subjective parameter, because each parameter assesses different aspects of the nasal response. So, for uh, subjective parameters, we have the symptom score. For objective parameters, we need a measurement of the nasal patterns. So, symptom score. We have different types of uh, scales to grade the symptoms. We have the total nasal symptom score, which is a 12-point scale, uh, measuring four nasal symptoms, rhinorrhea, sneezing, obstruction, and itching. Then, uh, as you know, in the 80s, we have uh, two scores, uh, the Linder score and the level score that were proposed in the 80s. And apart from these four nasal symptoms, they also include an evaluation of the ocular symptoms that many times uh, occur in parallel to the nasal symptoms. And the score, of course, the ARIA guidelines propose us the visual analog scale, which is standardized and also includes uh, evaluation of the four main nasal symptoms. What about the objective assessment of the nasal patency? In the EACI position paper from 2018, four methods are considered acceptable hmm, to perform the nasal challenge. One is the peak nasal inspiratory flow, then is the acoustic rhinometry, this is the after anterior rhinomenometry, and the four phase rhinomenometry. Each of them has their advantages and disadvantages. Of course, the peak nasal inspiratory flow is the easiest and cheapest. But um, it has also some disadvantages because required collaboration, more collaboration from the patient, relies on the lung function, and this is based on my personal experience, uh, I think is less reliable. There are more variability among uh, repeated measurement if you use the peak nasal inspiratory flow. So, I mean, in my opinion, it's better than nothing, but from the four, it's the less recommended. This is my opinion. Of course, the other four, in general, I am, are more uh, specific, more sensitive, more reliable, but uh, uh, require technical resources and trained personnel. That is a great disadvantage because in the peak nasal inspiratory flow, you can perform it very quickly, and uh, the, the same physician can can uh, can do it with the patient quickly. For the others, usually you you will need uh, more personnel. That is uh, an obvious disadvantage. Of course, they, as you know, they measure different things. In the rhinometry, we measure volumes. In the rhinometry, we measure air resistance. So it's not exactly the same. So and next, how do we interpret the the outcomes, which is also tricky. So in the position paper by Leaki, uh, it is very clearly said that uh, we can consider a test positive if we have a very strong variation in objective parameters in the nasal patterns, very strong variation in subjective parameters, only with one of the two parameters, if there is a very big variation, you can consider the test positive. But if you have like moderate variations in both the objective and subjective parameters, you can also consider the test positive. So I, there are different ways to, to, to get positivity. So of course, now the most important thing is, okay, what is high variation, what is moderate variation? That is not fully established at all. Uh, and uh, this is only recommendations, but I mean, are most basically in, uh, in experience of experts, but more than in real, uh, true evidence, okay? So in general, uh, a clear positivity for subjective measurement 
uh, for instance, the symptom score, if the patient scored higher than five or higher than 55 in the, in the bus, this is clearly positive. But if there is an increase to three, that is moderately positive. And with the objective parameters, in general, it's considered a clear positivity, a variation higher than 40%, and a moderate positivity, a variation of 20% of high. So if we have these points, five points, or more than 40% separately, we can consider a test positive. But we, if we combine more than three points and a variation higher than 20%, both occurring in the same patient, then we can consider also the test positive. Of course, there are potential sources of error of both false positive results and false negative results. There are many different uh, situations that can uh, lead us to a, to a misinterpretation of the test, but I want to highlight in false positive results the presence of the nasal cycle. That is always a, a situation that occurs very often, that one patient, for instance, have a very high variation uh, in one of the nostrils, a decrease in the volume in one of the nostrils, together with an increase of the volume in the other nostril. This is mostly, I mean, most likely related to the nasal cycle, and this should not be considered positive. So there has to be a decrease, bilateral decrease, a bilateral decrease in the volume, for instance. So this is how it should be. And the false negative result, of course, the most common situation that arises in the clinic is that the patient has not kept properly the was out periods for the different drugs. And this can, but there are, of course, many other, many other possibilities, like lack of adaptation to the room climate, that the patient, as soon as uh, he or she enters the room, is performed the nasal challenge. That can also create problems. Okay, and then from a practical point of view, what is the procedure of the nasal challenge? So this is a general procedure with a general basis, and then I will describe it more in detail. We need to perform a baseline measurement that will be the reference for further measurements. After the baseline measurement, we go to a challenge, control challenge measurement, meaning that we need to challenge the patients with the diluent of the allergen, without the allergen, only the diluent before administering the allergen, because we need to control for nasal hyperreactivity. So before administering any allergen, we need to exclude that the patient has nasal hyperreactivity in this specific moment. And then after the control challenge, we go for the allergen challenge. Where for the symptom score, we only perform one determination per measurement. So one determination at baseline, one determination after the control challenge, and one determination after the allergen challenge. But for the nasal patency, we do, we do three sequential determinations. For instance, if we use acoustic rhinometry, we measure three times eh, to limit technical variability, and then with the three times, we perform an average, and we consider the average as the measurement, okay? So this is the extended procedure. Uh, first of all, the patient arrives, and we have to check that meets requirements, that the was out periods have been currently kept, etc. Then we wait for 15 minutes for the patient to acclimatize to the room, and then we perform the, base, the baseline measurement, both subjective and objective assessment. After the baseline measurement, we administer the control solution. We can use the diluent of the allergen or saline serum, isotonic saline serum. We wait for 10 minutes, and after 10 minutes, we measure again subjective and objective assessment. So if there, there, there has been no change or very little change, we can proceed to, with the administration of the allergen. But if the patient develops a positive response with the control challenge, we have to stop the challenge that day, and we have to reschedule the patient for a different day. That is recommended. So if the control challenge is negative, we go ahead with the administration of the allergen, then we wait 10 minutes, and after 10 minutes, we measure again the subjective and objective parameters. If the test is positive after 10 minutes, we can consider the test positive, we stop the procedure. If it is negative, then uh, we can make wait another 10 minutes and make a second measurement of both objective and subjective parameters. And the second measurement can be positive and we consider the test positive. And if it's negative, we can say, okay, you are not allergic to this allergen, whatever other problem you have, this is not the problem or the cause of your nasal symptoms. Okay, 
so you see in every procedure we consider application sorry the nasal hyperreactivity you have to exclude nasal hyperreactivity we know that we know that nasal hyperreactivity occurs in every phenotype of rhinitis uh, but it's variable so so the patients can have more nasal hyperreactivity in some periods than in others so uh, sometimes you cannot perform the allergen challenge because the patient always has nasal hyperreactivity but in most cases if you schedule the patient we do in our department up to three times. If in three repeated measurements, the patient has nasal hyperreactivity, we give up. But uh, usually we schedule the patient for a different day or a different period of the year with the less allergen is enough and you can finally perform the allergen provocation. In the position paper by Aki, it's recommended uh, that you should consider positive only immediate responses, immediate, let's say, during the half an hour after the allergen application, or dual responses. Dual responses and they have an immediate response and a delayed response. There are very few patients who have an isolated delayed reaction, isolated without immediate reactions. That has been described that can occur up to 12 hours after allergen application. This is, in, in the position paper, this is recommended. It's not recommended to consider this positive. If the patient at home reports a delayed reaction, is recommended to repeat the test again, but not it should be it should not be considered positive only on the basis of a delayed reaction. And in general, as in any other procedure, after the procedure, doesn't matter if it has been positive or negative, it is recommended that the patient is in the hospital or in the clinic at least for 30 minutes to, as to be sure that nothing will happen. So this is our latest published article about nasal allergen provocation that came up a couple of months ago. So it's evaluate the safety and the, and the reproducibility of the test. So this assessment is based in 11,500 procedures, performing more than 500 children and almost 6,000 adults. And from these individuals, more than 1,500 had asthma symptoms. And we found extremely good safety outcomes is the test either uh, if you apply the allergen by micropipette of nasal spray is extremely safe 99.97 percent of the procedures were well tolerated so it's extremely safe which is very important for the clinical implementation of the test and about the reproducibility regarding the reproducibility uh, we performed the test uh, using level score as subjective parameter and acoustic rhinometry as measurement of the nasal patency and the reproducibility is also very high, 97.32%, with very high net positive and negative predictive values. Okay, so uh, you can see in this picture that uh, you, in our department, uh, we perform the test administering a single allergen per session of multiple allergen per session. This is also controversial in the ACI position paper, they only recommend one allergen per session, but we, uh, we have described, uh, the, or we, or the department where I work now, in 2011, described a protocol for performing challenge with multiple allergens in the same session. And this is also, um, uh, in the Spanish guidelines, it is recommended to only administer one per session, as in the European guidelines. But we published this article in 2011, as I said, and performing nasal challenge with multiple aeroallergens is a good screening method for local allergy rhinitis. Meaning that if you have the suspicious local allergy rhinitis and you administer up to four allergens in the same session and the patient tests negative, you can very easily exclude the diagnosis. You say non-allergy rhinitis. And in one session, the, the diagnosis is reached. You don't need to reschedule four sessions. So it has advantages, especially to rule out okay, local allergy rhinitis. This, a challenge with multiple allergies. So, and uh, just to sum up and to conclude, uh, the summary of methodological recommendations is to use always standardized allergen solutions uh, where we can know more or less what the concentration of the major allergen is, to perform the nasal allergen challenge bilaterally. Then there are two methods that are mostly recommended for allergen application which are the spray and the micropipette. In both of them, we administer, one, uh, we administer 100 microliters. In the spray, we administer two pools of 50, and in the micropipette, directly 100, but finally the patient gets the same amount of allergy. As I to use the visual analog scale, and as objective measurement, uh, the two uh, methods most recommended, and I'd say most performed, are the 
active anterior, anterior active rhinomyometry and the acoustic rhinometry. So I think that those two are probably better than the others. And in conclusion, nasal allergen challenge is useful. It's a useful clinical and research tool for allergy rhinitis. There is a need to far, there is a need of further methodological harmonization of the technique and the interpretation of the results should rely on the combination of subjective and objective measurement. And thank you very much for your attention. This is uh, our group. Yeah. Um, I would like to congratulate you because uh, you basically um, covered the whole field and uh, this is very important. And this is basically what we have to do uh, for our teaching program. And that means uh, um, each topic should be covered from the start to the end of uh, each one of our diagnoses uh, to, uh, and, um, and the treatment of the diseases. And in fact, uh, there were, uh, during your talk, few different uh, um, questions that was basically um, at the same time um, replied. And uh, for example, I would like to, um, uh, there was a questions from, um, from Spain uh, and one of our, uh, um, our um, the, of the attendants was actually uh, asking how to proceed with, uh, um, with the different brand names uh, that are on the market, uh, what I should uh, um, uh, use for my clinical therapy and, uh, and the diagnosis. And, uh, and I will briefly go through all of it. First one, um, the first question I would like to ask you, of course, you know, we are ENT and we, uh, we would like to approach to a new, uh, dimension we was uh, w which is uh, a research and the clinical aspect of uh, such uh, diseases uh, by in, in in that field i would like to ask you what are the implication of uh, of these uh, tests what are the benefits in uh, in um, uh, in advantage of a skin prick test of a rast test would you like to recommend not for the local um, not for the local uh, allergic rhinitis, but uh, if, if you have a systemic, not, not only nasal symptoms, but also ocular symptoms, uh, and in patients who are all, all also suffering from asthma, what, what are the best uh, choice that you would recommend? So I think that, uh, to be completely honest, if we exclude local allergic rhinitis, uh, uh, in the patients systemically sensitized with positive skin peak tests, the only moment when you can consider the test is for prescribing allergen immunotherapy. So sure. if you want to, uh, if you don't consider allergen immunotherapy or the patient doesn't want allergen immunotherapy, I wouldn't recommend to go through this laborious process because, I mean, the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis can be uh, easily done with a skin prick test, I would say. Uh, Maybe you are not 100% sure about the clinical relevance of a sensitization, but if you are not prescribing immunotherapy, it doesn't really matter because you will treat the patient the same way with, uh, with uh, symptomatic treatment. But if you consider allergen immunotherapy, then uh, in many patients are polysensitized. And sometimes even with a molecular diagnosis, it's not easy to, to know uh, if they are truly allergic to that allergen or not. Or if you think that there are four, four sensitizations in the serum that are relevant, you say you cannot uh, prescribe immunotherapy with four different allergens in the, same, in the same treatment. So you have to decide which allergen do you start with. Sometimes this you can be established by the clinic. The patient can tell you that this trigger is the most important for me, but sometimes it's not possible. And there are very overlapping uh, allergens in, in the environment, I mean, and it's impossible to differentiate if the patient has, uh, for instance, as alternaria and how does might are mainly overlapping. I mean, if uh, they all increase with dampness, so it's, it's very hard to differentiate them. Uh, from a pure clinical, asking clinical question to the patient. So the, apart from local allergy rhinitis, the, the nasal challenge is useful if you decide to prescribe allergen immunotherapy and the patient is polysensitized. That is the main indication. This is also covering another question. So you already uh, answered it to that, which was exactly this point. Another one, uh, other questions coming from Argentina. Uh, our colleague is, uh, is uh, an allergist, 
and uh, our um, colleagues is asking questions about uh, what about the patients that are underwent a previous surgery? What would you recommend in those patients? Previous surgery due to a nasal polyps or? I guess, I guess that uh, uh, he's referring to patients that underwent uh, a surgery like sinus surgery for a chronic rhinosinusitis with uh, yeah. nasal polyps. And I, I, I do believe in this case, uh, he was referring to a consequent also allergic rhinitis due to different and uh, multiple um, yeah. uh, uh, allergens. With patients with, patients with uh, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, uh, it's hard to perform the nasal challenge before surgery and after surgery because their uh, anatomy is very altered uh, even before the surgery or the, not the anatomy but I mean it's impossible to measure uh, volumes or, or very hard to to have reliable results and after the surgery even more because you know for instance if you use acoustic rhinometry you are measuring the two six volume that is supposed to be uh, uh, and the, in the in the in the lower turbinate, and if that is altered after the surgery, then you don't know exactly what you are measuring. So it's very, it's not almost impossible, not always impossible, but in most of the cases we have problems to use this test for patients with uh, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps either before or after the surgery. Other thing is the fact that it's what is the role of atopy or allergy in those patients that this is a very interesting topic i'm very interested by it exactly. because many of these patients are atopic but and some of them are really allergic but uh, others may be atopic but non-allergic i mean they might be sensitized but maybe it's not very relevant uh, that sensitization i don't know it's i think uh, uh, in most of the cases of these patients, we cannot perform the test, that is true. Other patients uh, who, who do not have a, a chronic rhinosinusitis but underwent surgery for other reasons, uh, is most, in most cases, uh, we can uh, still perform the test, but always, for, the, for instance, septal deviation, we can more or less perform the test, but also, always you have to take into account that if the, if the anatomy of the nostril is very changed, that we will have difficulties in uh, interpreting the acoustic rhinometry, but maybe we can uh, use other, other techniques, like maybe then a uh, big nasal inspiratory flow can be useful in that situation. Um, uh, this is uh, this is very interesting, and uh, uh, just because uh, by using the acoustic rhinomanometry, we should always consider it, uh, this uh, dysfunctional um, morphological things that are inside the nose, and this is the fact why we should uh, do a previous test before surgery. We are stressing much much more during the last years. Uh, um, on this uh, clinical research and uh, uh, preoperative uh, clinical assessment of the patient, because uh, actually the trend is going much more on uh, on uh, diagnosis and uh, pharmaceutical treatment, and this is because of uh, we believe and we we got to a point in which we uh, we uh, uh, finally um, got the, the opinion and the fact that nasal mucosa and uh, f anatomy is very important. And why, and when we are doing surgery, we actually change the anatomy inside of the nose. And that will lead to another point in which previous surgeon and previous surgery, uh, the patient that has been already uh, treated by surgery are difficult to assess. We are much more uh, inside of a, of, uh, of the nose right now because of endoscopes, because of different uh, ima preoperative imaging and imaging. And uh, we are now uh, approaching to those patients that has previously, uh, that has been previously operated. And this makes our difficult uh, new diagnosis, or basically those are not new diagnoses. These were actually the, 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 the first time the first um, correct diagnosis uh, before surgery so um, we are um, having a lot of emails and requests from uh, patients uh, there's a there's a big um, group that are um, made from patients that underwent surgery that are requesting us uh, to talk more and more about uh, clinical aspects and researches and that's why 
do we do believe that uh, uh, t talking about uh, um, some uh, uh, example and um, and uh, different uh, modalities of uh, uh, diagnosis for such uh, um, problems and uh, and diseases has much importance than surgery. Uh, another question that I would like to ask you, this is from Emirates, uh, this is once again based on uh, surgery. Uh, what about those patients uh, that uh, underwent uh, laser surgery on the inferior turbinates? Uh, what, uh, are you suggesting uh, any, um, uh, any of those uh, tests? And I do believe that, uh, that, uh, that he's referring to those copulation technique that underwent under mucosa and uh, those ones that are not affecting the mucosa. Yeah, I, I, I not very, uh, not, I don't have a lot of uh, knowledge about those uh, surgical techniques, but of course I heard about laser surgery for tubinoplasty. I think uh, uh, in, that, in those cases, it will be preferable to choose a method to measure the nasal patency, which is less influenced by the, by the uh, anatomy of the, of the nostril. Uh, probably acoustic rhinometry is the one who is more influenced because, uh, as I said, if you measure the volume to six, then you are measuring the specific distance uh, at, the, at the end of the lower turbinate between the septum. So uh, if that is altered with the, with, the, with, the, with the surgery, doesn't matter the method of the surgery, then we can have difficulties in interpreting the, the result. Maybe in that case, the, the, even the... the uh, active anterior rhinomanometry, which measures the resistance, but is less dependent on the specific anatomy, but on the whole resistance of the tube of the nostril, can be more reliable uh, after the surgery. But uh, this is my opinion. I don't have really uh, any any evidence to to refer to, to about this. About the, the last question, I would like to ask is because of the of the short time that we have. Due to the fact of the importance of the United Airway diseases and, uh, and uh, the correlation between the lower and the upper airway system, would you suggest any kind of, uh, of uh, immunotherapy? Or would you like to suggest um, uh, a treatment and a diagnosis in patients that are asthma uncontrolled? Okay. For Immunotherapy in uncontrolled allergy and immunotherapy in uncontrolled asthma is not recommended in general. Now we have uh, one product, this is the tablets for how does mites, uh, and uh, the indication you can prescribe the tablets either for allergic rhinitis or allergic asthma due to how does mites if the patient have a FIP1 higher than 70%. So from 70% to 80%, the patient will still remain in control, but you are still able to, to administer or to prescribe the treatment. But in general, I think that what we do in the clinic is uh, we first, before uh, prescribing immunotherapy, we control the asthma. So we, we get the patient to have control symptoms and a FIP1 at least higher than 80%. And after that, we prescribe allergen immunotherapy. Uh, that is, the, the, general, that is the, general, uh, the general recommendation. I don't know if you, there was more uh, questions in your comment. I can't remember. Apart yeah. from... Uh, no, basically, we would like to ask, uh, what about uh, um, performing... Uh, uh, and as a challenge in patients ah, yeah. with asthma. So, exactly, yeah. I mean, in the acuposition paper uh, of 2018, they say that severe and controlled asthma or COPD are contraindications for a nasal challenge. Uh, but this was based on, I mean, the logics, of course, the logics tell you that. Why are you doing this if the patient is not controlled? But in the article we published that I saw afterwards, mm, Actually, it was even even safe technique in patients with uncontrolled asthma. So there were 1,500 patients who had asthma symptoms, and in those 1,500, some were controlled and some were not controlled. I think that still is a good number, I mean, significant number of patients. Uh, but one thing is important. I mean, the main risk here is if the patient uh, aspirates the allergen and it goes to the throat and the lower air. That is the, the tricky point. So sure. you need like trained personnel uh, to 
teach the patients uh, how to do the procedure. And that's the reason why uh, we um, use the micro pipette because then the nurse can put it in the lower, in the head of the lower no, lower turbinate and, uh, and uh, it's more secure that the, the, the allergen will not go through the throat. With the spray, you are not that sure where, where you are putting the allergen because you don't see it, no? But uh, of course, you can also perform the test safely with the allergen spray. But uh, I think that is a very safe technique. The likelihood of having a bronchospans even in a patient with uncontrolled asthma is very small. But uh, if possible, I would uh, control the asthma before performing the nasal challenge, in, if possible. If we are in the situation that the, pa the patient has uncontrolled asthma and we are still doubting if this asthma can have some allergic trigger, and of course, we are not performing a bronchial provocation because this is even more unsafe. You can say, okay, I can perform a nasal provocation in a patient with uncontrolled asthma to be 100% sure if the patient uh, disease is related to allergens or not. I will stay say, okay, in those specific cases, you can still do it because the test is extremely, extremely safe with uh, precautions that the patient does in a, doesn't um, swallow or, or, or inhale or not inhale, swallow the allergy. No? Yes. But uh, I think that I think that safety concern shouldn't be an obstacle to to perform the test because it's very safe. So it's like uh, the results were very clear. Like uh, I, I insist, like uh, eleven thousand five hundred procedures. This is. Uh, uh, it's an amazing number, actually. Exactly. It's, it's kind of guaranteed. Um, thank you, thank you, Juan, because uh, this, you practically talk about the whole procedure from the beginning. What are the, the articles that are, could be referred? So please, uh, all of the atten uh, attendees, uh, go and check those articles. Uh, go ahead and uh, um, sign up for the Yaki Juniors uh, um, members. Uh, there's uh, tons of activities that, that uh, they are doing. Uh, the Yaki Juniors members uh, just uh, uh, guaranteed, how to say, uh, the, to continue the collaboration with the association as Asano. And we recently discussed about uh, a new uh, few other things for the 2020. I, 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 I just want to um, use these uh, this last minutes to uh, express my gratitude to you, Ivan, for the collaboration that we established last year and we are keep continuing. And for the Yaki Juniors members, please uh, sign up for the next uh, meetings on the 2020s. We would like to guarantee also other grants. Uh, we are actually providing one grant every year for the attendance of the ERS Juniors uh, meetings and I do hope to have uh, uh, the possibility to provide other grants also for the Yaki Juniors. Uh, we, will, uh, we will establish other um, ground rounds uh, online and other meetings uh, um, in places. And uh, by, by that, I would like to invite all the participants and their colleagues uh, for the segment uh, two of our adherent uh, first and 15 international ground runs. Uh, it will start uh, from the 1st of September to 15th of December 2019. This time it's going to be CME um, um, accredited and uh, more details are going to be published soon on our um, uh, website, www.nasosano.et. A lot of faculty um, is going to be is going to participate, and we are also going to have a talk on in the inter, in, a, in the international uh, consensus consensus on uh, um, allergic rhinitis. This talk will be covered from Sarah Weiss from the USA. Another talk is going to be uh, from surgery to clinical uh, things uh, in ENT and uh, allergy. Thank you for the, your participation, Ivan. It was uh, very much appreciated. Um, go ahead, uh, for all the attendants, go ahead. We will um, uh, release and uh, record the whole meeting and we'll be able on our YouTube channel. Uh, I would like to, uh, to congratulate you for the whole period of your presidential activity, Bon. And I also would like to um, thank uh, the president of the IACI for participating in, our, in one of our um, ground rounds. Thank you to all the attendants and the faculty member. 
I would like to uh, invite you once again for the, for the second segment and uh, see you soon. Thank you to you, Buya. It has been a pleasure. See you. Thank you.